Well, thank you, Peter. Um, well, I'm very honoured to uh, be invited to deliver this centenary lecture. I intend to speak for 35, 40 minutes, something like that, and then there'll be time, I hope, for questions and discussion. Um, just a few preliminaries. Uh, I'd just like to not only thank Peter and his colleagues for inviting me, much appreciated, I'd also like to take this opportunity of uh, thanking Gordon, your long-standing colleague, um, Gordon Bowles, who was on the WA Trustees with me all the time I was chair, <coughs> and was a wise and valued colleague throughout that period, and also had a great sense of humour. I should, I suppose, say that to be tactful that all my colleagues on the Trustees were wise and valued, <laughs> but perhaps some were more wise and valued than others, and Gordon was certainly in that category, and it's a great pleasure to work with him. Uh, secondly, as Peter's just said, um, I used to work here in this beautiful building. Uh, it's actually a ridiculously nice place to work. It's um, very beautiful and uh, it really was an overused word, but it was a privilege to work here and uh, it's a really nice way to, for me to round off my career. I was here for five years, although at times it seemed rather longer. Um, they were quite busy years and in many ways quite difficult years mainly because of the irrationalities of government funding policy for adult education with which you've been called too familiar. Uh, but they were great, greatly enjoyable years. I made many friends and, uh, and met many, many fascinating and highly intelligent people in Cambridge. It's a real powerhouse intellectually. It's full of not only brilliant people, but extremely eccentric and interesting people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, many interesting discussions and more, more interesting listening to people way out of my own uh, fields of expertise across the pivot tables all over Cambridge. So it was a great time and I really enjoyed it. Maddingly, as you will be aware, a beautiful day like this is a lovely place and I hope that many of you will take the opportunity of having a look around the gardens this afternoon. Um, I understand you've got a tour arranged with Richard Gant, uh, my or a colleague and friend who I was chatting to last night, and as Richard pointed out, like everywhere else, the cold spring this year meant that everything's almost a month late, so you'll get in the garden at a real peak time, really, I think, the best time of the year of all. It's usually mid-June, early to mid-June. That, that's where the, the plant life is at the moment, so do have a look around, especially the wall garden, which is one of my favorite places. And uh, lastly, in, in, in terms of preliminaries, a, a word or two about my own association with the WA. It goes back many years. I've, I've been involved with the WA on and off. I've never been full-time employed by the WA, but I've been involved with them on and off since the late 1960s. Uh, when I moved in 1970 to what was the extramural department in those days of the University of Leeds, I was uh, to, to about the most junior administrative post you can imagine. I was uh, fortunate to be brought under the influence of Fred Sedgwick, secretary of the then, then Yorkshire North District. Fred took me under his wing as he had many other young men and some women coming into the field. He was one of that great generation of WA leaders of whom Frank Jakes from this region was another. It's from men like these that we were inducted into the trade and from whom we learned about liberal adult education in all its complexity and importance, socially as well as educationally. My most recent book, written with colleagues, is about E.P. Thompson, the radical historian and political activist and a prime exponent of adult education in the WA tradition. Thompson, as you probably know, many of you, is mainly associated with Yorkshire and its working class, most notably in his great book, The Making of the English Working Class, which was published 50 years ago in 1963. But what you may not know, and I certainly didn't until we began researching this book, is that Thompson's very first adult education, adult education teaching wasn't in Yorkshire, it was in Cambridge with the WA. Um, on his return from war service in Italy, as a very young tank commander, to complete his degree at Cambridge, he undertook two courses as a part-time tutor teaching English social history. 
And Frank Jakes was in fact one of Thompson's referees for his first lecturing job at Leeds University, <laughs> which Edward joined in 1948 and stayed at Leeds until 1965. When we were researching for our book about Thompson, we delved into the Leeds University archives and found correspondence from Jakes and Leeds University about Thompson. Jakes's formal reference about Thompson was very positive, as, as it might well be, and his abilities and his commitment. However, Jakes also wrote confidential letters to the Leeds Registrar and to the then head of the extramural department, Sidney Raybould, drawing attention to Thompson's membership of the Communist Party and therefore <laughs> of possible considerations of political bias. I thought that was a very interesting episode. There's much that could be said about that and its wider ramifications, and indeed much that could be said about Edward Thompson and his achievements. But that, as they say, is another lecture, and I should really return to my subject for today, and that is <clears throat> to look at the WA in our own times, in the 21st century, and try and discuss at least some aspects of what it's for, what, what should we be doing now, uh, that we, which maybe we weren't doing 100 years ago. Well, as you know, all of you, the WA formally came into existence in 1903, and by the time your own region was inaugurated, the WA had become a strong national presence, and its formidable originator, Albert Mansbridge, was beginning his work of spreading the WA idea throughout what was then the British Empire. The WA grew from a variety of traditions and built upon the earlier university extension movement from the 1870s. Again, this is not the place for a full discussion of the extension movement, but it is worth noting that Cambridge was the first into the field in 1873. I always used to make a point of stressing this when I was giving talks at Oxford that we were <laughs> <laughs> ahead of them. And a colleague already mentioned that James Stewart's portrait is in this building, and I think you asked people to locate it, so I know exactly where it is, but it's not very difficult to find. Um, James Stewart was a formidable character, a real polymath, and an enthusiast for adult education. And it was due to James Stewart and his work that uh, Cambridge University was persuaded to in engage in this, what was then an extremely innovative and radical form of educational provision. The history of the extension movement, to anyone who's interested in this, this byway of English social and educational history, is, I think, fascinating. And the, the standard text, the authoritative text, is by my old head of the department, Norman Jepson, uh, The Beginnings of University of Education, which Norman published in 1973. Uh, it's very sad when I was present and gave the oration at um, Norman's funeral not many years ago. He lived to a good age, and uh, he was a great man. So if any of you are interested and haven't read that book, um, it's still in print, I think, but it's still, certainly still available in libraries, mm -hmm. and it's a good read. Anyway, I've, I'm digressing again a bit. I'm, I want to talk mainly about the WA today, but to understand the present, it is, in my view, always necessary to look, albeit briefly, at some aspects of the WA's early history, or at least some of the ideas that were current in its early years, and see how they play, play out, how, how they're replicated, or how they've changed in today's world. As an aside, I should add that as someone who believes that history is the foundation of discipline for all the political and social sciences, I found recently what I think is a rather nice quotation from an American commentator, Ambrose Bierce, about the fallibility of history and of historians. History, he wrote, is an account mostly false, of events mostly unimportant, which are brought about by rulers, mostly knaves, and soldiers, mostly fools. <laughs> Suitably chastened, I would nevertheless go on to point out the contrasting strands of thinking in the early WA which have persisted in amended form throughout our history and characterise still, I would argue, the essential coalition that is the modern WA. But it's maybe a bit schematic, but I would identify four strands within the original WA, which as I say, I think are still there, although the language used and the context are obviously very different these days. There was first 
and probably the most important strand, I would argue, a strong, altruistic, and primary Christian-inspired belief that it was the duty of established society, including the universities, the church, and individual members of the upper and upper middle class, to bring high culture, and more generally, the joy of learning to the great mass of the uneducated general adult public. Ancillary to this, and following on from the extension movement, there was a commitment to enfranchising education league women, in practice largely middle class women. All this took place, of course, in a society where most people left school with rudimentary education at 13 or 14 or even earlier. My two grandfathers, for example, were both born in 1890 and were, broadly speaking, from the lower middle class in London, both left school at 12. And where manual work was the destiny in those days for the large majority, or work in the service sector for females. Only a tiny percentage of the relevant age group attended university. And indeed, many years later, in 1964, when I was lucky enough to go to university, the age participation rate, that's the percentage of people between 17 and 21 who went to higher education, even in 1964, it was less than 8%. Mm -hmm. And now it's getting on to 50% if you take the whole of higher education. There have been huge changes, but nevertheless, that, that motivation is there very strongly in the beginning and is there now still, I think. Secondly, the same group of people, that is the liberal establishment to use shorthand, or most of them at any rate, believe too that with the increasing power of the organised working class and with universal suffrage on the horizon, it was imperative to engage the working class with the rich culture and the parliamentary democratic traditions of the established order in Britain. This can be seen, I don't think many people would deny that was motivation, but this can be seen in two contrasting ways. It can either be seen, and has been seen by uh, many writers, as evidence of a commitment to the educational enfranchisement of the working class, or, alternatively, can be seen as its incorporation into the ruling order and its ideology. Two of the leading exponents of either points of view, both uh, co colleagues and, and friends, um, Lawrence Goldman, uh, who's now at Oxford, um, who wrote a very interesting book called Dons and Workers about Oxford and working class education 15, 20 years ago now, and he's just about to publish, or maybe has just published, a new biography of R.H. Tawney, which I'm very much looking forward to reading. Lawrence def defends very much the first point of view, uh, and uh, a, a, an old friend of mine from Leeds, my co author of the book about it, Thompson, Roger Fieldhouse, who's written widely about WA and is in fact a former WA tutor organiser many years ago. Um, he takes very much the latter view and has written about the WA and its incorporation, its incorporationist tendencies in various books and articles, as you may know. Anyway, I leave that as an open question, but it's an interesting debate. Thirdly, there was a strong and growing identification of many in the WA with the mainstream labour movements. From this point of view, the key task of the WA was to ensure that the working class was educationally equipped in an age of universal suffrage, especially in subjects like economics, politics and the social sciences, to take power in a modern democracy and usher in through the parliamentary system, through the ballot box, a more egalitarian social, social and social democratic order. And finally, further to the left, there were those in the early years of the WA, a very small, or pretty small, but very vociferous group, who saw bourgeois education, as they termed it, as a cul-de-sac, and wanted the WA to teach explicitly Marxist approaches to the working class in order to equip the embryonic revolutionary movement for the overthrow of capitalism and the establishment. This resulted in a whole variety of conflicts in the early WA uh, and eventually in the formation of things like the Plebs League and later the National Council for Labour College, National Council of Labour Colleges, the NCLC, uh, which was bitterly at odds with the WA through, all, through the 1920s and 30s. Later still, the Communist Party and kindred bodies established their own educational adult provision in the 1930s, and Margot Heinemann one of the official historians of the Communist Party has written very interestingly about those bodies too. 
But that, as I say, seems to me to be a, a very much a minority strand and certainly hasn't replicated itself in today's world in anything like the same form. But that, that view that the existing order it needs radical restructuring, if not overthrowing, is still there within some aspects of the adult education coalition, I think. Overarching all these strands was the unique voluntarism of the WA. And I do think this is a, I, don't, I hardly need to turn an audience like this, but this is a key part uh, uh, then and now of, about the WA. It remains a democratic body controlled in the end by its voluntary adult members. And whilst this has resulted on occasion in tensions between the voluntary members and the full-time professional staff, and that was certainly the case in the Leeds area of the Yorkshire North District generally in my time in the 1970s and 80s, a very turbulent relationship indeed at times. Um, and whilst it's led also to perhaps to somewhat burdensome structures of representation, nevertheless, despite these things, voluntarism is a uniquely important aspect of the WA which has made it, from the outset, a prominent example of democracy in action. David Cameron's idea of the big society, about which, personally, I'm extremely sceptical for all sorts of reasons. <laughs> if that means anything at all, then the WA is the big society in action. But I turn now to the contemporary context for the WA, where these strands are, as I've said a couple of times, in my opinion, still present, though of course expressed in rather different terms, very different terms. The educational world has changed dramatically since the WA was founded, and indeed since the time when I first became involved in the 1960s. In addition to the obvious changes, amongst them the massive increase in education and training opportunities for all sections of the population, the increasing sophistication of learning technology, computers and all that, which I must say I have struggled to come to terms with as a, as a Luddite of the First Order. One of the most difficult things I found when I retired was to learn how to use a wretched computer because I'd always had somebody to do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's really sanitary. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm joking apart, the learning technology advances, particularly in the last 15 years or so, have been huge and they will transform, they are transforming the way that we all learn and succeeding generations will be, will just regard these like, like I regard pen, pen and paper. Um, then thirdly there's been the feminization of the workforce and of the much reduced trade union movement but it's notable how, how the culture of the trade union movement has changed too. With the prominence of women in almost all areas of life, at least in relative terms to the past. In addition to all these obvious changes and many others, there, there are perhaps other things that aren't quite so clear and which I'd like to just spend a little bit of time trying to outline. The first point I'd, I'd like to make is that whilst there is undoubtedly persisting inequality in our society, in many ways I think you could argue that certainly at the moment it's getting worse or you know, more extreme, Nevertheless, the old, the old class structures when the WA was founded, which were quite clear at the time, as well as with hindsight, those, those inequalities have become much more complex and diffuse and malleable, even though social mobility has improved very little. In the place of clearly defined and self-aware classes, we now have an elusive mosaic of inequality. And amongst other things, this makes the task of the educational provider much more difficult. In training are now perceived to be absolutely central to the economic well-being of society. And this is something that's become increasingly the case over the last 20 or 30 years, not just in Britain, but throughout the developed world. Education and training are now seen, as, as some analysts have put it, as a, as a capital good, in just the same way that, that raw materials in the early years of the Industrial, industrial Revolution were seen as. Uh, capital goods. They're absolutely central to the knowledge society. The increasing sophistication of modern economies and their technologies and the rapid pace of change necessitate a high level of education for an increasingly large proportion of the population. And that, as far as one can see, is only likely to, to increase that tendency to, to increase to make this much more central than it has been in the past.
thirdly, and cl closely linked to this, we now live in a very scientific and technological age, and this dominates our culture at all levels. The so-called STEM subjects in higher education, science, technology, engineering and maths, and vocational training generally, are given almost unquestioned priority. And this is a real change from um, past decades. Fourthly, the twin bureaucratic processes with which you, like me, will be all too familiar of audit and inspection, on the one hand, and credentialism, I mean, the, sh the shorthand way of saying that everything to have value to, to getting funding and so on now has to have credit or certification or some form of um, formal uh, notification of educational attainment. And, but both these processes now pervade not only education at all levels, but all public sector structures. And finally, there's the whole, in my view, quite iniquitous dominance now culture of private, private good, public bad mentality. Whereas in the 20th century, largely, the public sector was seen generally as legitimate and as providing valuable social good. The privatized and marketized culture we now live in is seen as superior, and the public sector is denigrated repeatedly, at least implicitly. Many, many examples could be given of this, but one very obvious one, I think, is the consistent changes in language in the public sphere with which we've all become, to which we've all become accustomed. For example, on our now privatized railway system, and I make no comment here about whether that's a good or a bad thing, we no longer have passengers, we have customers. <laughs> in universities, vice chancellors are increasingly referred to and increasingly see themselves as chief executives. And indeed, we had an interesting discussion on trustees, as Gordon will remember, about how to advertise the post for the new general secretary. The headhunters were very keen we should term it entirely chief executive. That there were many of us on the trustees who wanted to retain the title of general secretary, so we came up with a not very original fudge of general secretary and chief executive. <laughs> <laughs> but such terms are now common parlance, and they, they're not just terms, they, they portray, they symbolize a change of, of culture. And we're all now used to the language of mission statements, BFM, value for money, cost benefit, etc., etc., etc. These are all things that have been imported from private business. I'm not, you can tell I don't think much of it, but I mean, you're not, I'm not necessarily saying it bad, but we should note the insidious na uh, nature of this um, cultural change. So we have an educational context now in which the culture of funding and the perceived priorities are dominated by science, engineering, and technology, and by a series of neoliberal business assumptions and the consequent emphasis upon scientific materialism and vocationalism. Well, that's the world we live in, and maybe the old WA with its 20th century preoccupations is hopelessly out of date. Maybe we have to use the cliche to modernize or die. Maybe we should jettison the cultural studies programs of mainly arts and social studies subjects, or at the very least provide fewer of them and only at the full cost. Maybe we need to give priority to vocational training, updating and vocational and job-related programs. Surely it is argued that adult education is to play its part in making Britain, or to use another cliche, UK PLC, <laughs> a modern, competitive and efficient society, organisations like the WA should radically reorientate themselves and their provision to come to terms with contemporary realities. This is a seductive picture, at least for some. It sounds purposeful, trendy, modern, and that buzzword these days, relevant. It is, though, in my view, you'll not be surprised to hear, dangerously mistaken, not just in emphasis, but fundamentally so. There are both principled and pragmatic reasons for this assertion. At the level of principle, and I think this, if there's one thing I wanted to emphasize today, this is it. At the level of principle, it needs to be reasserted forcefully that a democratic society requires an educated and involved citizenry. This is not an add-on. It's not a luxury which those who indulge, wish to indulge, should pay for at full cost. 
it is absolutely fundamental to a democratic civilised society. I think you only have to look today at the levels of alienation, of trivialisation of the crass cultural products, not least our notorious tabloid press, and at the widespread political ignorance and cynicism, which are now at an all-time low. These and many other things speak to the depths of the problems we face in the social and political sphere, and therefore in the educational sphere for a social movement like the WA. The steady diminution of public support funding for educational provision in arts and social studies has now culminated in the higher education sector, and largely in the further education sector too, in provision, if it's made at all, being more or less at full cost. It's not fanciful or far-fetched to see in the, for in the foreseeable future that only a handful of elite universities, especially Oxford and Cambridge, will be high-level providers of arts and social sciences. This is quite a disastrous scenario, in my opinion, for, for the reasons I've outlined. Secondly, on this list of principled arguments, we should remember that that great adult educator, Raymond Williams, argued that the primary purpose of the adult educator is to critique the prevailing common sense. And perhaps there never was a prevailing common sense that needed so much critiquing as this one. At its best, the WA is a countercultural force. In an increasingly homogeneous culture, we should always be asking the awkward questions, confronting established, assumed <coughs> ideological truths with other views, other explanatory frameworks, and enabling learners to find their own way to their own conclusions by ensuring that they have full exposure to and understanding of competing frameworks of analysis. Thirdly, because school education and increasingly post-school education is so dominated by utilitarian criteria and by the emphasis upon examinations and other credential outcomes, as I've mentioned, the WA must play its part in ensuring that education is seen as good in itself, as our founders argued so strongly. But education, without any ulterior utilitarian purpose, widens and deepens our understanding and appreciation of the world and the cultures that inhere within it. The joy of learning is a, is a reality, as, as we all know, and there are so few people, relatively few people these days, who benefit from that realisation. Fourthly, as our society becomes more unequal, so it is apparent more than ever that the WA's social purpose ethos is more relevant now than in, even in the past. The WA currently provides a valuable and very varied program of targeted work with particular communities. The recipients of awards at the parliamentary event in late 2012 were truly inspiring. We need to do more to publicise and extend such work. And I should just like to add here that that, that event, which was a really remarkable success, very well attended in the morning by a number of politicians from both the Commons and the Lords, from all parties. That event was entirely the idea and the work of Ruth Spellman, our new, well, new then uh, General Secretary. Uh, she didn't have a terribly easy induction, and it's a great credit to her, I think, that she had this idea and she drove it through, uh, and it did the WA a lot of good. There are now increasing numbers of people trapped in cycles of deprivation Government cuts to local authorities, to the voluntary sector and to social services are severely exacerbating these problems and it's likely to get worse, not better. Analyses of adult education provision generally over many years conducted by NICE have demonstrated that for such hard to reach groups, it is the initial process, the group involvement and the confidence building that is more important than the content. Two years ago, I was asked to make the Olive Cordell Awards to outstanding disadvantaged learners and tutors. It was a memorable experience. The recipients all testified that in very dire life circumstances, I mean almost unbelievably dire life circumstances, it was the WA that had been quite literally a lifesaver. These were stories of a triumph over adversity and against the odds, seeing education as the only means of self-realisation and redemption. 
So this work is, is extraordinarily valuable. Finally, in terms of the principled arguments, I think it's increasingly important for the WA to preserve and advocate a voluntarist ethic. Education as other institutions is being increasingly bureaucratized and structured, and in recent years dangerously imbued with neoliberal ideology and practice. As the, uh, amongst many other things, Michael Gove's attempts at city academies and so on seem to me to demonstrate. The WA's voluntarism bucks the trend and sets an example for others to follow. And the Eastern region, with its strong branch structure and very large cultural studies program, provides a particularly vibrant example of voluntarism and action, and has done over many years. Just turning briefly to the pragmatic arguments in favour of the position I've been outlining, these seem to me to boil down to two, and they're both in a way quite negative. The first is that there are an awful lot of big fish, big predatory fish, fishing in the pond of uh, funding for vocational training and the like. And the WA does not have the credibility, the expertise, the commitment and the experience to engage in that world. So it's a, it would be a dangerous game. I'm not saying anybody's advocating this directly, but I'm just saying it, it's always a, it's a tempting danger because the money is big, the government support and the social culture is all driving in the same direction. The second argument takes a little bit longer to uh, uh, describe, but I think it's essentially very simple, that in higher education, uh, the old extramural and continued edu continue education departments where I've worked for most of my career have very largely disappeared for all sorts of reasons. In all the big civic universities, Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham and so on, uh, they mostly don't exist, exception to Sheffield, but, uh, but mostly they don't exist. The post-1992 universities, the old polytechnics, though they provided uh, vocational part-time programs attracting adult learners and some access courses, never did offer liberal adult education. So there's a bit of a vacuum, or more than a bit of a vacuum there, in the higher education world. Scotland and Wales are partial exceptions to this trend, but things are getting worse there. And Oxford and Cambridge are also honourable exceptions, of course. Though even here, liberal adult education provision is much less than in the past, and the work that we pioneered in my time here with disadvantaged communities in the Cambridge area has disappeared altogether. Perhaps the WA might consider an approach to my successor, Dr. Rebecca Lingford, to discuss possible partnerships in the provision of social purpose community programs in the region. A similar situation obtains in the further education sector. <coughs> LEA community adult education has all but disappeared in the light, light of local government cuts, and FE colleges for similar reasons have largely ceased to provide any adult education, save for A-level courses and to an extent access programs. There is therefore, for the worst of reasons, as I say, a vacuum which only the WA can fill. There are opportunities here for imaginative cross-sectoral partnerships which could provide much needed local programs for local communities. And I should just add here that I was pleased to hear Peter um, talk about the conference, the Biennial National Conference, which is again being held in Cambridge in October, which I have to say I should be at, um, and that um, you mentioned some of the key speakers and uh, I'm going to be on a panel, I think, at the end of the first day with some of the speakers, amongst whom is Les Hebden, and I think he says, worst effect of who he. Um, I'm very pleased that Les is going to be there. Les is the new-ish director of the Office for Fair Access in the higher education sector, trying to stimulate and guarantee that universities play their part in admitting non-traditional students from a widely participation background. I talked, I don't know this, but I talked to, I talked to him uh, briefly a few months ago. And he's very keen to set up cross-sectoral uh, access arrangements between the FE sector, including the WA, and higher education. So um, there's an open door to be pushed out there. And former Vice-Chancellor of the University of Bedfordshire. <laughs> Indeed he is, yes. Indeed he is, Gordon, yes. <laughs> so a thoroughly good egg, really. <laughs> Um, he's a nice chap and um, he's keen to work with us and he's got money. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, as much as at any time in its history, I think the, the WA has a central, vital role to play. Its educational provision and ethos are unique, and it has potentially an important role to play in buttressing and developing a truly democratic society. There are, as always, challenges, and I've just talked briefly about one or two of those. Challenges are always with us, and I suppose that was, that's what keeps us interested. Be, I suppose it would be a bit dull if there weren't challenges, although it would be nice to have rather fewer of them, perhaps. Um, the challenges for WA in the short to medium term seem to me to fall under three heads, practical, ideological, and organisational. Uh, and they're easy to, to spell about like this. They're much more difficult to deal with, as I, as I know. And I sympathise with people like Ruth and uh, the senior management team who are trying to cope with them. Practically, the most important thing is keeping the show on the road, especially funding. And uh, that perennial problem for the WA and similar organisations um, of something with a devil with a long spoon, i.e. how close do you get to funding organisations, funding bodies uh, whose objectives and approach you might not be totally in sympathy with, how far do you get into cahoots with playing the agenda according to their rules in order to get their money to do what you want with it. Mm -hmm. It's an old problem and it's a delicate political balance um, and never more delicate than now, I guess. But it's like the old argument about um, theory and practice. There's not much point in having the most beautiful, pure theory if you can actually put it into practice. So getting the funding, keeping the show on the road is sine qua non of um, the organisation continuing and thriving. I say easy to state, it's difficult to do. The second practical issue, which I know Ruth is particularly um, exercised by and, and expert in, which I'm not, I am exercised by it, but not expert in it, um, is marketing. It's quite extraordinary how few people, even people that one would expect to know about the WA, actually do know about it. I've lost count of the number of times, and I, people have said, what are you doing now? And I said, oh, involved with WA actually and they said, oh is it still going? You know, <laughs> and these are people you'd expect to know about education. So we do need to market ourselves much more vigorously. Um, and even when people do know that the WA exists, they quite often think as I remember John Denham and other in, other, in many other ways an admirable and, and pleasant kind of liberal Labour minister talking about um, leisure courses like Spanish for holidays. Um, <laughs> I, had no, I had no conception of what the WA does, even though you know, he's a Minister of Education and, and, and generally well disposed. I think, just in passing, uh, to, again as an aside, the best minister we've had for in, involved in the field of lifelong learning, WA work and so on, much to my surprise, was John Hayes. Um, who, when I first met him, I was told, you won't have, you've got to behave yourself, that you have nothing in common with him, he's a right-wing Tory, he's one, you know, etc, etc. And we got on like a house on fire, and he was absolutely committed to adult education, and did a lot for us, I think, when, in his time at, um, in that ministerial portfolio. Um, the second group of challenges, I think, are ideological, and could be stated very briefly, but again, um, difficult to put into operation. First is withstanding the pressure to become vocational, as I've been arguing, in, in, in a very neoliberal context. And secondly, um, maintaining the dynamic between the strands noted. Maintain the coalition, and even whilst not necessarily agreeing with others. That's been a rocky road in many ways in the past, but it's an essential part, I think, of the WA's appeal and its character. It manages to keep all these balls in the air at once. And organisationally, well, as ever, I think we need to look at ways of getting newer, younger, more diverse members involved in the, in the branch structure of the voluntary movement. Um, it's an ongoing, it's been a problem or issue with the WA ever since I've been involved, just about 50 years or so. Um, and secondly, simplifying committee structures whilst, main, whilst maintaining democracy and um, making sure the communications, both up and down, so to speak, 
are better than they are, or better than they have been at some times in the past. Again, I think easy to say, very difficult to do. So those are some of the challenges which you might wish to return to in a minute for, for questions and so on. Um, I've got plenty of time. Certainly. I just wanted to end with three quotations pertaining to my theme. The first is from, you might be surprised to hear from Edward Thompson. Uh, the second from my friend and former colleague Peter Scott, what, writing in his regular column in this week's Guardian um, on the 2nd of July, if anybody wants to look up the article, which is well worth reading in its entirety. And the last one is a favourite quote of mine from an American writer called Brand Blanchard, who wrote some years ago now a book called The Uses of Liberal Education. So, beginning with Edward Thompson, he's actually writing about um, how to become active and effective politically, but the same thing applies to education, I, I think, after education. Thompson believed consistently in the human agency of the common people to achieve radical change, and within this argument, he always placed an emphasis upon action. He said, the end of politics is to act, and to act with effect. And he said this, I might say, as a, as a very uh, persuasive and erudite theorist, as well as a, a practitioner. And he added after, in another quote uh, later on in the same article, he added, to survive in this infinitely assimilative culture, one must put oneself into a school of awkwardness. One must make one's sensibility all knobby, all knees and elbows of susceptibility and refusal. And that seemed to me quite a good, good motto for the WA in many ways. And Peter, Peter Scott, writing a scathing critique of this government's attitude towards education in general, and higher education in particular, in this week's Guardian, as I said, concluded with the following, concludes with the following paragraph. The public funding of science and scholarship, the idea of the public good, the independence of research, the critical values of enlightenment, all are bound together in a delicate web. So much more is at stake than pounds, dollars, or euros. It's our soul. And he's absolutely right. And finally, from Brent Blanchard, which is uh, a quote I've got pinned up in my study. The thought of Plato remains, the art of Sophocles, the logic and ethics of Aristotle. No doubt there were hard-headed practical men in Athens who stopped before the door of Plato's academy and asked what was the use of it all. Then their names have vanished. That little academy has become a thousand academies amongst nations then unborn. There is a moral, I think, in this history. It is the usefulness, the transcendent usefulness of useless things. Yeah. <laughs>